for it. So I think on the syllabus, and I think in the if you look at the powerpoints and the numbers, that technically obesity and body composition is the next thing um, that we that we might potentially be doing, and then this was supposed to be after that. But I want to do this first, and then we'll pick up on on obesity and body comp next week. Okay. So this is one of those things that. I think we don't sell it in its level of importance enough, all right? And so what we're gonna learn about today is a couple of things. First and foremost, exercising is dangerous. Despite all of its benefits for us, exercising carries with it some level of inherent danger, okay? And that danger is going to kind of occur on a spectrum or a sliding scale based upon some individual characteristics of the person that's going to be exercising, okay? And so for most people, and even people that are at high risk, exercise is not nearly as dangerous as, I don't know, like bungee dump, jumping or skydiving or you could pick something, okay? But it is still, there's still gonna be some level of risk and then that's gonna go up dramatically if you have certain characteristics. So we're gonna learn what are those characteristics why are those things going to put us at an increased risk and how do we go about figuring out kind of what we're supposed to do about that okay and so i've got some things i'm going to have you guys practice filling out and you're going to have some, some of your friends fill them out um, for so i always come back to this right we've seen this about three times already but it's just a reminder exercise good physical activity good okay the more we are active, the, the higher our fitness level. Remember, this physical fitness is VO2 max in essence, okay? So it's aerobic fitness. The more active and the more fit I am, the lower my overall mortality rates. So exercise is good for us, okay? Always remember that. The problem is, is that vigorous activity, okay? So as you guys kind of hopefully put on the test on a few answers, vigorous intensity activity, so things like resistance training, things like jogging or running or biking or stair mastering, even if it's the weird stair mastering where we kind of go sideways and we do like weird, like, you know, kind of kick outs. You all know if you've done those, I see you all, maybe not you all, but I see people like doing crossover on the, on the stairmaster, I don't, I don't really understand. But vigorous intensity activity, okay, which is what we need to drive improvements in fitness. These are going to be things that come with some level of inherent risk, okay? Some level of inherent risk. And what we are really, really concerned about are two things, okay? And that is that during a bout of exercise your risk of having a sudden cardiac arrest or a myocardial infarction, so a heart attack, of having one of these two things happen, increase pretty significantly from not exercising, from just sitting there at rest, okay? And so that's the primary thing. We are worried about are you going to have some type of cardiovascular pathology, some type of cardiovascular event while you're exercising, and then there's a potential that that can kill you, okay? And so we're gonna kind of get into a little bit of the, well, why does exercise raise those risks over rest, even though the more I exercise, the better my overall outcomes for these things are going to be, right? If I can chronically exercise, my chances of having these things go down compared to a person that's sedentary, but by doing the exercise, at least during the bout, I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise my, my chances. Okay? Guys, does that make sense? You all understand that's the thing that we're worried about, okay? Okay. Very, very typically, this is going to be due to a person having either a diagnosed cardiovascular pathology. So you have some kind of cardiovascular disease that we have diagnosed, right? You have high blood pressure. You have, I don't know, you have atherosclerosis in your coronary arteries, okay? 
you've had a stroke, something like that. You've had it, it's diagnosed, we know about it on the front end. The more likely thing that is going to happen is that there are, even some of you in this room right now, and that includes me, that very often have what we call a silent form of cardiovascular disease. And that means that you have cardiovascular disease, you have some kind of pathology, but it is not manifested yet. It may not show up on all of our tests, or you may be young enough or otherwise healthy enough that we have not chosen, we've not been screened for these kinds of things. Okay? You guys can see every year, although it's less this year because we can't get together in these big groups, but every year, especially it tends to be in the summer, you will see that when there are these big marathon races like the Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, somewhere, these are people that are in good cardiovascular shape. They're in good sort of aerobic metabolic shape. They can run a marathon and you, you will see some sort of otherwise young, healthy, fit person will have a sudden cardiac arrest and will die during a marathon or during some kind of thing like this. Or you'll see a football player or a basketball player or something that will not have heat illness, but they will have a heart attack or they'll have sudden cardiac arrest while they're out there doing this kind of thing, okay? It is rare, but it happens, and those people have very often had something, some form of like silent cardiovascular disease. I was going to ask you, what happened to the Maryland football player last year? <sighs> to the best of what we know, yes. But there, there, with those kinds of things, there's always, um, there may always be some kind of underlying. You gotta take a supplement that might have put me at increased risk. Or there are other, other kinds of sort of prescription or recreational drugs that may or may not. We don't always get the whole story on those kinds of things. Um, if maybe the last, I don't know, four or five days has taught us anything, and people are often very loath to share their protected health information. Um, in that way, there's a law called HIPAA that means that you don't have to share it. Um, and so it's hard for us to always know kind of what is what is out there and what isn't. Although the, the guy in Maryland, part of that was also, that was some heat illness things and it was a little, a little bit different in some ways. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay. So we've talked about that exercise is beneficial for not without risk, okay? All right. So if we're worried about a heart attack and we're worried about a myocardial infarction, what we need to do is to try to identify people that are going to be at an increased risk of this prior to having them begin any kind of exercise, okay? The goal is let's figure out what your risk is before you do something, if only because that protects you and then that also protects us as the people that might be prescribing exercise to you, doing, doing personal training with you, being a strength and conditioning coach, whatever it might be. It also protects us from the liability of you having a heart attack, but also kind of the you know, sort of obvious emotional trauma. Okay. So how do we go about doing all of that? Well, we need to do at least initially, we can ask you questions about certain certain characteristics that you may have, okay? What do you have? Do you have a family history? Do you have, right, do you have cl certain cholesterol levels? Do you have a certain blood pressure? We can ask you things, and that will help us determine how risky it's going to be for you. Once we have done all of that, if we think you're at somewhat increased risk, we can have you go to a doctor and have a physician evaluate you and potentially have them do some kinds of either exercise testing on you or cardiovascular especially testing on you, okay? I will tell you guys, one of my, um, and this is a little appalling, but also not that surprising. So one of my former undergraduate and master students, he's now in medical school now, and he is always texting me, one, saying how bad they don't understand exercise, that they teach things incorrectly, but that, you know, they get, they're in med school, they get a month of 
pathology and anatomy and phys on a particular organ system and the diseases that affect that. So our, our thoughts that the doctors know a huge amount about a huge amount of things is maybe kind of an overestimate. So what I would tell you guys is that especially for these kinds of things, okay, if you're going to a general practitioner, they're going to know a little bit. Cardiologists will know a bunch, but a lot of the things that will happen during the physician evaluation, you guys are gonna leave this class, you're gonna leave our major knowing just as much, if not more, about how to do these evaluations than regular physicians are going to, okay? Now, cardiologists, they can do the test, they can interpret the test, but you guys are gonna know just as much as kind of what they're what they're going to be able to do okay all right so the purpose of our appraisal what we're looking for from the very get-go okay initially is identify some sort of known medical problem okay have you had a heart attack have you had a stroke do you have type 2 diabetes do you have osteoporosis do you have some sort of diagnosed and known medical condition that might be either worsened or put you at further risk of something during a bout of exercise. So we need to ask you this, right? We have to ask things. I could say something like, Liz, do you have high blood pressure? Do you know if you have high blood pressure? And she would tell me, we hope, okay? We could ask, Nick, Nick, are you a type two diabetic or are you a type one diabetic, right? Have you had an ACL tear or something in the past? Do you have something that's out there that we need to know about in order to assess your level of risk, okay? In the absence of those things, okay, in the absence of that, this is especially important in youngish, okay, otherwise healthy individuals there's a pretty good chance that the vast majority of you have not had a stroke or a previous heart attack. The vast majority of you, we will occasionally see a type 2 diabetic in y'all's age group. We will see some type 1s, but rarely are we going to, in younger folks, see these kind of diagnosed diseases. So then that doesn't mean that you're completely safe. Then we have to know, okay, what are the characteristics that you might possess, okay? Are there behavioral factors or things about what it is that you do that might lead to increasing your risk of these health problems? It might put you at a greater risk of having a heart attack during a bout of exercise. Okay? So we need to ask questions about things like, do you smoke? Okay? We want to find out what your BMI is and decide, are you obese by BMI? Do we know what your blood pressure is? Do we know what your cholesterol levels are? Okay? Do you have a family history of having cardiovascular disease or people having heart attacks at what we would consider to be a young age? In those things, all right. So there are going to be kind of characteristics and behavioral factors that can predict reasonably well the onset or the risk of these things happening if you haven't had one already. Okay. Other things that we can ask are if we have you go exercise, or we can say if you've ever exercised. What do you feel like? Okay, we call these things signs or symptoms. Okay, so we could ask Emily, say, Emily, have you ever gotten dizzy when you exercise? No, okay, that's good, right? If you get dizzy during exercise, not like exercise like my daughter where she just twirls, like not that, like, but if you just, I'm gonna go for a walk, I'm gonna go for a run, and I get dizzy, that's a warning sign. We would need to know that. Okay. Do you experience shortness of breath? Do you experience certain kinds of pain in your feet or in kind of your left shoulder and your left arm and up into your neck? Do you experience angina pain? We'll talk about all of these things in the coming slides, but that's what we're looking for as well. Okay. Do you have something? When you exercise, do you experience these signs and symptoms that are going to tell us there is an underlying pathology? And in the absence of both of those things, what are some sort of your characteristics and behavioral risk factors that might put you at increased risk? Okay. So, and then if all of those things are reasonably okay, then we can do fitness testing on you. And we can look at your fitness testing, and then based upon your, your test results, we can also then kind of further judge um, what might be happening. Okay. 
So I will ask this. How many of you guys have, have ever been to a gym or some sort of workout facility? Almost everybody. Think back to the first time that you went to one of those. Okay? Did they make you fill out some sort of paperwork and ask you about, like, do you have health problems? Or something along those lines. Did they ask you anything about that? You guys remember? Anybody remember when you went over to the Huff for the first time if they made you they made you fill out paperwork and things? They did. They should have. So, because I have to redo mine every year because I'm, you know, an old faculty member. Every year when I go to renew my membership, I have to refill out the same paperwork to check and make sure that I'm theoretically still okay. Right? So, some places do, some places don't. I will tell you that what we do over at the Huff is not enough. We've had conversations with them about that, but it's, it's tricky. So I'm going to give you guys some questionnaires today that you're going to fill out. And these are the things that you need to know. We're going to talk about it. Well, if you do this questionnaire, we have this information. We can determine if it's safe to do this kind of exercise. We can have more information than we can learn that this other kind of exercise may, or may not be safe. Okay? All right. So one of the things that we're looking at, and this is a mnemonic device, and I'm not going to ask you guys about all of this. Um, but this was a thing that one of our uh, one of our former undergrads she put this together several several years ago, and so I just kind of wanted to share. But when we're doing an evaluation of your health status, and you guys will see, I'm going to give you a questionnaire. And it's from the American College of Sports Medicine, and it is called a health screening questionnaire. And as part of all of this, it's going to ask you things about what is your medical history. We're going to assess certain risk factors. We're going to ask you about medications that you're taking. We're going to ask you currently how physically active you are. And then based upon all of that, we will establish if we need to get physician's permission to have you exercise. And then we can do kind of the, the back end things where we actually do a fitness test. Then we set up exercise prescription and then we evaluate kind of how that prescription is going. But what we are going to focus on today is going to be these top four things, and then we're going to use that information to do our fifth things to establish positions. Okay. All right, so I'm going to give you guys these questionnaires now, and then we'll talk a little bit about them. So I'm going to start these here. This first one that I'm giving you is going to be the second one that we talked about. This is the, the longer version. It's called a health screening questionnaire. Going to be more in depth. I'm going to have you guys fill these things out. Okay. For my folks on Zoom, if you will get on Canvas, they are available on Canvas, and you can you can download them from there and at least look at them and follow along if you'd like um, as, as we go along here. And the second one that I'm going to give you is called the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire or the PAR-Q. So let's start with, okay, let's start with the part two. So let's start with this questionnaire. What I want you guys to do is look at this one, and you will note on the front here, and it's, this is going to be, this is the most up-to-date version. The one that's in, um, that is in the PowerPoints is about a year old, or this is, this is about a year old now, this updated version. Um, and so it's going to ask the same questions, but it looks a little bit different. So what you guys are going to do is you're going to answer these questions either yes or no on the front of our um, of our thing. Okay. So there are four questions, which is kind of a misnomer because question one has one, two, three, four, five, has six parts. So there's really ten questions that are on here. Okay. 
okay? So read through this and fill them out, okay? And then we'll talk our way through kind of what, we're, what information we're getting from this. So I'm going to do it too. Anybody need more time? Okay. So, what what you guys are going to notice about the parking? All right. One, it's from Canada, um, which doesn't always sit well with, uh, with with some of our folks. But what we're going to get from the park queue is going to be things like this. Okay. So, the park queue is the most kind of basic level of screening that we can do. This is going to get us just some of the most high risk kind of information that we can. Okay. It's not going to be super in depth. It doesn't ask a lot of really invasive medical history questionnaire. It doesn't ask much about kind of medications and things that you're taking. It doesn't ask much about kind of behavioral or lifestyle risk factors. All it's really doing is just kind of a very simple, very fast, if you answer yes to any, any of these questions, you are probably at a significantly increased risk of something bad happening during exercise. So you need to go and get physician's clearance, okay? So it asks very simple things, right? Do you have a diagnosis of or treatment for some kind of heart disease, okay? stroke, pain, discomfort, pressure in your chest during activities, right? So do you have cardiovascular disease, basically? Has it, has it been diagnosed? Yes or no? Okay. Do you have high blood pressure? Yes or no? Do you experience dizziness or lightheadedness during exercise, which would be a sign of pulmonary impairment or cardiovascular impairment? Do you have shortness of breath at rest? Not during exercise, but at rest, you have trouble breathing. Okay. Do you ever lose consciousness or faint for any reason? Again, these are signs of difficulty in the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system of, of bringing oxygen in. The new thing on here that is not going to be on the slides is it asks a question about if you've had a concussion. Okay. If you've had a concussion recently. Okay. Then it's like, do you currently have pain or swelling that affects your ability to be physically active? Okay. This is going to get at some kind of past uh, injury or something. Has a healthcare provider told you you should avoid or modify certain types of physical activity? Have you ever been told by your doctor that you shouldn't do this or you should do it in a different way? And then the last one is very broad. Do you have any other medical or 
physical condition that may affect those things. This cannot be or it is not meant to be. I don't like exercising. I think it sucks. Therefore, that's a mental condition that, so that I should not be able to exercise. Okay? It's just very, very basic, very straightforward kinds of things. If you go to the Huff and you're going to sign up for the first time, they should make you fill this out. Okay? This is what this is what they normally do at the Huff. Is this? Okay? The problem with this, okay, is that this questionnaire is designed to screen to make sure it's safe that you do light or moderate intensity physical activity. Okay, light or moderate. So does anybody remember? Moderate intensity physical activity is going to look like what? What's walking? Very good. Okay, walking is moderate. Is weightlifting moderate? Mm, probably not. Is jogging moderate? Unless you jog really slowly, no. Okay. Any kind of most of the kinds of exercise that people are going to do, like at the hop or just in general, are not going to be moderate. They're going to be vigorous. If you're doing something to try to improve, especially in folks y'all at y'all's age and my age, if you're trying to improve either muscular or cardiorespiratory fitness, it probably needs to be vigorous in intensity. And in that way, this questionnaire is not necessarily specifically designed to screen us for that, okay? Because vigorous intensity activity, for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about, is inherently riskier than moderate or light intensity, okay? So this is good. It's better than nothing, okay? It's gonna catch some things, but it's not the best thing for most of what you guys are gonna likely end up doing, okay? okay? Anybody have questions about that? You guys understand? I mean, it's very simple. If you answer yes to any of those questions, it's like it's like going to jail in Monopoly. Do not pass go, right? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you go to your doctor, and we have to have physician's clearance before you can exercise. Okay? That's what's going to happen with us. So the next piece, though, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to derive that information from the health screening questionnaire. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what the questionnaire is going to get at. Then we'll have you guys fill it out, and then we'll talk about your results, and then we'll do some, we'll do some, some kind of more in-depth components. Okay? So the usefulness of the health screening questionnaire is that it's going to collect enough additional information that we can for sure be able to get a better answer on is it safe for you or is it as safe as possible for you guys to perform vigorous intensity physical, vigorous intensity physical activity or not. Okay. So with the ACSM risk stratification, it's going to ask questions about diseases. It's going to ask questions about do you have certain signs or symptoms during physical activity. It's going to ask about medications, and it's going to ask about lifestyle and behavioral risk factors. Okay? And so based upon how we get answers to those questions, we're going to put you into one of three categories. You're either going to be a high-risk person, a moderate-risk person, or a low-risk person. And based upon the, those categories, that will determine what intensity of exercise do we think it's safe for you to do right now. And, and if it's not, then we need you to go and get physician's clearance to be able to do those kinds of things. Okay? It's going to be reasonably straightforward. If you're a low-risk person, you can do whatever. Okay? Any intensity, any kind of exercise, we think it's reasonably safe. If you're a high-risk person, go to your doctor. End of story, done, go to your doctor. If you're a moderate risk person, it's kind of like the far cue. You can do moderate and light intensity exercise without physician's clearance, but if you're going to do vigorous, which is what most people do, then functionally you also need to go and get physician's clearance. Okay? Those are going to be the things that we're going to need to do. All right? 
And so there's going to be, um, in essence, an algorithm where we're going to we're going to walk our way through. You answer this question in this way, this other question in this way. So if you have certain characteristics, then yes, you're automatically high risk, or no, you don't have those, so you can't be high risk. We'll talk our way through all of that. But what I want you guys to do for me now is you don't need to fill out your name or your address or anything else. Just start on section two, fill out section two, section three section four and section five okay to the best of your ability fill those things out okay so let's walk our way through this one all right so in section two Okay, and kind of the, these three little sections, the heart history and the symptoms and then potentially the additional health issues that are going to be here in section two. Okay, these are going to be things that we would call contraindications to exercise. Okay, these are absolute contraindications. These are things that if you have one of these, you have to go to your doctor and get physician's clearance to exercise. So if somebody answers yes to one of these things in section two, they're considered high risk, okay? High risk, end of story. Yes, sir. I have a question about that. It says on the number for additional health issues, you can take this with your medication. Okay, so that's true. So we have to then look on the back where it asks you to list what those prescription medications are. Okay, so if it is a medication for some kind of cardiovascular issue, some kind of metabolic issue, that's fine. If you're like me and you take a prescription SSRI for anxiety, not a problem, right? So we got to look then at what the individual drug is. So I apologize with my misstatement that that is, the, the medication one can kind of go either way, okay? It depends upon what it's going to be for, but you know, kind of common things, like psychoactive drugs, things for anxiety, depression, ADHD, birth control are kind of the most common things that we tend to see in folks that are kind of y'all's age um, are those kind of big classifications. You'll sometimes see prescription pain medications that are given um, with that sort of stuff. Stuff is probably not going to be made worse by it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Good catch, okay. These are going to be, do you have cardiovascular disease or some other kind of known metabolic or pulmonary disorder, or do you experience what we would call signs and symptoms, okay? Chest discomfort with exertion, unreasonable shortness of breath. What is unreasonable? I don't know, okay? That's kind of a, a normal thing. Um, you take medications for your heart, like do you, you know, what, you're going to have to decide on your own kind of what's unreasonable. And then dizziness, fainting, or blackouts, either at rest or with exercise. Okay, those are going to be those are going to be the things that we're really really worried about. All of those things are going to provide information that there's a reasonable chance that you may have some kind of underlying cardiorespiratory or cardiopulmonary pathology, and that's what we're worried about. If that can be made significantly worse by exercise. Okay, so. Yes to any of those things. We're going to look at the medications a little bit farther, but yes to any of those. If you are high risk, go to the doc. Okay? If you're high risk, go to the doc. So if you are going to come and be in a study in my lab, depending upon what we were doing for a lot of things, we have people fill this out and we have to look at it and decide, okay, is it safe? Okay? If you are in a um, if you're in one of our activity classes like weight training or god forbid they call it tone and sculpt or whatever which really upsets me the tone word we talked about my, my hatred of tone have you done that yes okay i always forget it's worth mentioning again um but in in that way you should have filled one of these out in addition to the park view in addition to um, the consent forms in which you're going to get your instructor should have gone through all of this and checked to make sure that you didn't need physician clearance to, to do all of our things. Okay? All right. So, front side, yeses, 
you're high risk. Okay, that's the easy part of this. Now we've got to move to the back where it becomes a little murkier, it becomes a little more gray area on what are we doing, how are we doing it, what does it all mean? Okay, okay. So what it's asking about in section three, these risk factors for coronary artery disease. The primary thing that's going to lead to sudden cardiac arrest or lead to a heart attack is going to be atherosclerosis or blockage in your coronary arteries. Remember that your coronary arteries are the arteries that bring blood basically to the heart. Okay. When you get a heart attack and you get sudden cardiac arrest because SA node has stopped working, you get a disruption in, in the conduction system. It is likely due to a lack of oxygen in the cardiac muscle. Okay? And so very often, as we will see when we start talking about cardiovascular disease, that oftentimes this stuff is made worse during exercise. If you've got blockages in your coronary arteries at rest, when cardiac output is low, when heart rate is lower, when stroke volume is lower, then you can actually provide adequate amounts of blood to the heart. But when you begin to exercise or when you get stressed out and cardiac output goes up, then you need more oxygen for the heart and that's when it may come to that effect. Okay? So that's why exercise can be so uh, potentially so dangerous. So in the absence of having this diagnosed or having these symptoms, we want to look at, okay, these are going to be risk factors for what we we're going to call atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, okay? risk factors. These are going to be characteristics about you that will put you at potentially an increased risk of having all of this happen. Okay? So we're going to ask, we're going to talk a little bit about age, then we're going to talk about these other seven risk factors. We're not going to worry about a negative risk factor because then it becomes kind of a double negative and so it's a positive. Um, we're going to focus on these kinds of things. Okay? So here's what I want you guys to do when we think about this. Okay? When we think about this. Age is going to be its own, its kind of own category of risk factor. All right? Age is going to be its own thing. So if you are a man who is 45 years or older or a woman who is 55 years or older, we need you to get physician's clearance to exercise. So I am rapidly approaching having to have physician's clearance to exercise, which is a little appalling for me, um, but that's where we're going to be. Okay? That's an absolute. If you don't have any of your other, the, any of the signs or symptoms or known diseases, age is a thing. Okay? Man at 45, woman at 55. Then we need physician's clearance. Now, these other ones, you guys may have seen some of these things before. Some of them you may not, so we'll kind of talk our way through. We have seven, okay? What we're gonna, they're gonna call them positive risk factors. I just call them risk factors. So there are there are seven behavioral or lifestyle risk factors that are primarily gonna put you at an increased risk for coronary artery disease. And they are a family history of having a heart attack or the requirement of a, what we would call a coronary revascularization. So this would be bypass surgery or putting a stent or something, okay? Cigarette smoking, being sedentary, being obese by BMI or having a waist circumference over a certain amount, having high blood pressure, being what we call dyslipidemic, which is just you have high levels of blood cholesterol, okay? And then being what we would call a pre-diabetic, okay? And so some of these are easy for us to have answers to. I can just ask you, do you smoke? I can ask, we can measure your height and your weight. We can calculate your BMI. I can ask you how active you are, okay? Others of them, especially these last three, okay? we're going to have to make a measurement to get there. Measuring blood pressure, not that difficult. We can do that pretty reasonably. These other two are going to require us to draw blood, okay? Even if it's just a finger stick in order to, to be able to assess what these values are going to be. 
So we won't always know this, okay? So a show of hands, how many of you know what your blood cholesterol levels are? I've had it checked within like the last six months, okay? One of you, okay? Sarah, do you mind me asking like why you happen to know when nobody else does? Okay, very good, okay. Does anybody know what your fasting blood glucose levels are? This is wake up in the morning, you've not eaten anything for at least 12 hours, first thing in the morning, how much sugar is typically in your blood at that point? Anybody know that one? Okay. Last time I went to the doctor, because I had to switch my primary care physician um, he retired and I had to switch to a different doctor in his office and then they had to treat me like a new patient so they could force me to come in so they could throw my insurance for a, for a doctor's visit. They, of course, I had to do, this was in the middle of summer, I had to do a blood panel and it was in the morning and I had eaten breakfast, not even after lunch, I'd eaten twice in that particular day. And they're like, oh, well, we're going to try to measure your fasting, your blood glucose levels. And I'm like, why? This is, you're, it's not going to be at all interpretable because I've eaten today. This is of no use. And they, they measured something else. Shockingly, they freaked out. and like, oh, well, you, you think you're like a pre-diabetic. And I'm like, no, I just had lunch, right? Like, this is wrong. So they looked at some other things that are in there. We'll talk about when we get to diabetes. They looked at my hemoglobin A1C levels. They're like, no, we're just kidding. Sorry, you're fine. I'm like, yes, I know. But... These we may not know, and so that may create some issues around how we interpret what you put on your piece of paper, okay? So if you hadn't written your name on it and I had you swap with your neighbor and you were looking and they're like, I don't know what my LDL cholesterol levels are, I don't know what my total is, I don't know what my HDL is, we have to have a way to kind of interpret that and deal with that, okay? So let's talk through all of these things, okay? So think about this with yourself, okay? Family history is going to be, do you have a first degree blood relative, okay? So this is mother, father, brother, sister, okay? Can't be step, doesn't need to be grandparents, okay? If any of you are adopted, then even we would have to know your actual biological parents, okay? Or a biological sibling any of your first degree blood relatives, okay, on, on a male, so your father or a brother has had a heart attack or coronary revascularization before the age of 55, okay, or a female blood relative before the age of 65, okay. So please keep an eye on those numbers. Don't get them confused with the age criteria for needing to get physicians clearance, okay? So if your father, let's just say, had a heart attack at 45, then that's considered a family history of a risk factor for you, okay? Ladies, you all tend to have fewer heart attacks than men, and you tend to, if you're going to have one, have them at a much older age than men, okay? Uh, we don't fully, fully understand all of the hows and whys. A lot of that may be related to lifestyle factors and things, um, but that's kind of where we are, okay? That's family history. So having a heart attack, having sudden death, kind of from cardiac arrest, or coronary revascularization, okay? That's a risk factor. Are you a current cigarette smoker or have you quit in the previous six months or maybe do you live in a place or with someone who smokes so that you have environmental exposure to cigarette smoke? Okay. You may ask me now, Dr. Black, I'm predicting that some of you vape, okay? A very common kind of thing. What does, do, what does vaping count in this? And as of right now, the answer is no. Would it surprise me in a few years when these next guidelines come out and once we have more data, there's probably a reasonable chance that they can be on there. Um, and that's gonna kind of make things a little, a little bit crazy. Okay, so what does it mean to be a cigarette smoker? It's not on here, okay? 
how many cigarettes do you smoke, okay? How many packs a day do you smoke or anything like that? What we tend to mean is someone that like you smoke every day, okay? Or you smoke most every day, even if it's just a couple of, a couple of cigarettes. This is not, okay? This is not, I went out and maybe I'm a social smoker. This is not, I had a couple of beers and I, you know, grabbed my friend's cigarette and took a puff on it. It's not that, okay? This is really and truly like I, you know, I, I am a, I am sort of a, a smoker for the sake of smoking. Kim. Yes. Correct. It does not. We have, uh, so this is the most accurate thing, okay? They've changed the form because in the vast majority of places, uh, not everywhere in Oklahoma being that, there are ordinances now where you can't smoke indoors, right? And the vast majority of um, Sort of, if you don't own your house, then you probably also you can't smoke like in your apartment or or something like that. And so, in a lot of places, you can't smoke in any kind of public like space. You've got to you've got to be outside. So that's why they've taken it off of there. But technically, you know, if you live with someone who smokes in the house all the time, then that's probably just as bad. There's all kinds of things about like like tertiary smoke exposure, like your neighbor smokes inside and it gets so the person that lived in your apartment before you smoked and it gets like gets in the walls and the wallpaper and the paint and things or the carpet and it stays there. All kinds of kind of crazy things. Okay. Good question. Being sedentary. Okay. So being sedentary does not simply mean you don't meet the ACSM physical activity guidelines. Okay, I haven't graded that question yet, but I hope that all of you put the right answer on that on the test, right? 150 minutes of moderate or 75 minutes of vigorous. To be considered sedentary, okay, you are not participating in 90 minutes of what we would call moderate intensity. So they're calling this VO2 reserve. Think of this as heart rate reserve. So basically 40 to 60 percent of heart rate reserve or 40 per 60 percent of VO2 max aerobic activity on at least three days a week for at least three months. So if you get 90 minutes, less than 90 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity, okay, which also works out to like 20 minutes of vigorous you know, intensity physical activity in the course of a week, and you've been that way for, for at least three months, you're considered sedentary. It is hard to be a college student on our campus and be sedentary, okay? Unless maybe you're in a fraternity and you've got pledges that will drive you around to every class and everywhere and do those kind of things. I mean, it's hard, right, for you guys to walk around to your classes and not get this much activity. But it's a very low amount, okay? So that's what it means to be sedentary. It's not just not meeting the guidelines. We have obesity. Now, obesity is defined by the body mass index, okay? By the body mass index. And this is your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared, okay? So many of you may not know your BMI right off the top of your head, but you could pull up a thing on your phone or on the computer and type in your height and your weight, and we could get it within about 10 seconds, okay? So, this is BMI of 30 or greater, regardless of sex, is considered obese, okay? Is considered obese. In the absence of a BMI, okay, if you are a man who has a waist circumference of greater than 40 inches, or a woman that has a waist circumference greater than 35 inches, that also counts. So you might, and there, there would be rare cases of this, right, that you maybe aren't obese by BMI, um, but you, you, have, you have a particular sort of what we would call visceral adiposity, which is meaning that you deposit fat right here kind of around your belly button. Think about typically the, the kind of thing that we, that we talk about is think about older men that have a beer belly, that kind of prototypical beer belly, okay? 
we had a guy who works as a mason come to look at some bricks at our house do some brick work yesterday and he was like this tiny normal person and then he just had just, a, just like like a bowling ball right here all of the rest of him was like i am like a five foot eight like 150 pound guy but then i just have a bowling ball so he might not have been obese by bmi i didn't ask him how much he weighed that would have been you know probably not great for me but there is a chance that his waist circumference was 40 inches or greater okay when we do our kind of poor excuse for lab number three where we talk about obesity and body composition you guys will measure your waist circumference okay so guys we're talking about measuring essentially at your belly button okay around at your belly button ladies for y'all it's actually in a lot of you going to be a little bit higher it's the smallest distance pretty much between your your belly button and and probably up kind of near your sternum okay the waist in women tends to be a little bit higher because of the, the angle of y'all's hips and those kinds of things okay this is not just guys do you have a 30 you have a you know you have a 40 inch you wear 40 inch like pants or something like waist in your pants so we need to actually make a measurement there okay that's obesity hypertension we need to pay attention on this one okay so to be hypertensive means you have high blood pressure and to be hypertensive you can either have an elevated systolic pressure or an ele elevated diastolic pressure. So systolic pressure is pressure during contraction of the left ventricle. Diastolic pressure is the pressure when the left ventricle is relaxed, okay? So if systolic pressure is greater than or equal to 140 millimeters of mercury, or diastolic pressure is over 90 millimeters of mercury, it does not matter how much over, that's considered to be a risk factor, okay? Now it says on here, or you take antihypertensive medications. If you take antihypertensive medic medications, then you are diagnosed with cardiovascular disease and you should be a high risk person. We never can, and we, we emailed the people that put this book together about all of this. This should not be there. It's just a, a blood pressure. It's going to be diagnosed. Technically it needs to be at rest when you've laid down for like 20 minutes in a nice dark calm place and it needs to have been measured on two separate occasions to confirm that it's going to be high. If you measure under that, you're like, you're fine, just sort of go off, okay? So that's where we're gonna be with that. Dyslipidemia and prediabetes. So dyslipidemia is going to, to be dyslipidemic, you either have to have an elevated total cholesterol level or an elevated what's called low density lipoprotein cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol, that's the bad kind of cholesterol. And we'll talk a lot more about LDL and HDL and those as we get into cardiovascular disease, okay? But if you have an LDL level of greater than or equal to 130 milligrams of LDL per deciliter of blood, okay? Don't worry about the milligrams and the deciliters, but if you've got an LDL value of 130 or greater, okay? So high bad cholesterol, if you have low good cholesterol or HDL under 40, or total, which is those two things added together, okay, total greater than 200, then you are going to be considered dyslipidemic, okay? Additionally, if you are taking a lipid lowering medication, okay, then that's also going to potentially count as a risk factor. That doesn't mean you have diagnosed cardiovascular disease. That just means you're taking a lipid lowering medication. Medications that lower blood lipids, things like Crestor um, and Lipitor, they're called statin drugs outside of um, drugs for erectile dysfunction and metformin for type 2 diabetes, which is boost glucose tolerance, are the most widely prescribed medications in people over the age of like 45. Okay, so these numbers, all right? You can get some weird things with this, like my mother has elevated LDL, and then she has an HDL value that's higher than her LDL, okay? So her LDL is like 150, her HDL is like 180. So she looks like, if you just look at things, she looks like she has this 
very, very high, very elevated cholesterol levels because she does. In her, and some cardiologists do this now, they've taken that they look at the ratio between HDL and LDL. And so if your ratio gets high, or I guess it would be LDL to HDL, so if the ratio is high or you've got significantly sort of more LDL than HDL, which she doesn't, then that can be considered the risk factor for them. Okay, so sometimes you get some kind of weird results. We keep talking about buying a machine. You can buy a thing that's called a cholestat. You do it, take a, you guys maybe do this in, don't you ever measure this in, in physiology class? I know you guys do the blood, the blood glucose levels in physiology class. Just you all, you know, they typically have not done this, but they're been talking about it, of doing the, the cholesterol. There's a machine, you prick your finger, you get a drop of blood, you put it on a little, uh, little capillary tube, and you put it in there, and it will measure your, it will measure your cholesterol levels. And we can get the, your answer in like five minutes. We've talked about buying one, we do this in lab. Um, for those things. And then pre-diabetes, okay? This means that you are a person who is not yet a type two diabetic, okay? Or not yet a type one diabetic, mostly type two. You have not yet become a diabetic, but you are showing the initial signs of having difficulty bringing glucose into your cells. And so we call this impaired fasting glucose, all right? So fasting glucose is the amount of glucose in your blood first thing in the morning after a 12 hour overnight fast. So if your fasting glucose is over, equal to or over 100 milligrams per deciliter, but under 126, if you're over 126, you're diabetic. Okay, or if you have some sort of an impaired glucose tolerance test where your two hour values on the oral glucose tolerance test are gonna be at a certain level, then we're gonna consider you to have pre-diabetes. In human phys here, you guys did an oral glucose tolerance test, right? You drink the little sugary drink and then they prick your finger like every 15 or 30 minutes and you plot out, right? You get a known amount of, of sugar and then you look at how it goes up in your blood and then it gets cleared out and comes back down. People that are pre-diabetic are going to have a bigger spike and it's going to stay up longer. It's not going to come back down as quickly as people that have normal function. Okay? So these are our seven risk factors for everything. What I want you guys to do is look at your piece of paper. Okay? Look at your piece of paper. Count up the number of these that you said yes to. Okay? And then... Let's think about what we do with this, this bit of information, okay? If you have yes to one or zero of these, you're considered a low-risk individual, okay? One or zero, you are low-risk. That means you can go do any kind of exercise that you want. High intensity, low intensity, right? Doesn't matter. If you have two or if you have all seven okay two to seven of these means you are a moderate risk individual okay a moderate risk every semester and i harp on this and harp on this but every semester people always get this a little bit confused okay these are risk factors so you can have seven that doesn't make you high risk okay two three, four, five, six, or all seven, and you're just gonna be a moderate risk. Having four or five doesn't mean you're at a greater risk than somebody that just has two, okay? You're still just a moderate risk. People that are moderate risk can walk, okay? And that's about it without physician's clearance. They wanna do more than walking, they need to go get physician's clearance. Okay? Y'all with me so far, you think, I apologize in advance, these numbers that are on here, you just have to memorize them, okay? You just got to memorize them. Okay, so let's take a break. And then once we're done with our break, I will give you guys some, uh, some case studies with these that you can look at and try to put all of this together and actually see if you can, if you can do it for yourself, okay? All right. You know, resume recording. Okay, so one of my groups that put low, tell us why you thought you put low. So I don't care, one of my three that's here. 
हमारी शेयर So we're not going to concern ourselves about, and I think it actually has to be, it has to be over, I think it's over 60 before it, it becomes a, a negative, negative restrictor, so, um, so that it becomes a good thing. So let's not worry about that. Okay. So do we know her fasting blood glucose? Do we think that's a problem that we don't know? Derek says yes, Chandler, you're shaking your head no. Derek, why yes? Just be like, just like okay. Okay, Chandler, you're saying no. So why are you saying no? Derek makes a good point. Yeah, I mean it's important that like you can study on like the line because that will that is like one factor. Okay. Okay. Derek says we're borderline. Okay. Both of you guys are making reasonable arguments. I will I will explain in a moment what we're supposed to do when we don't know that, because it can be in the Okay. Uh, currently taking oral contraceptives. Do you all think that's a problem? Probably not. Okay. Um, attends group exercise class two to three times a week. What do we think? Do we think she's sedentary or not? Okay, so what else would we need to know about what happens in a group exercise class? Duration. Need to know duration and intensity, right? So the you know the honest answer is they're probably going to be somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour, and they're probably going to be some level of vigorous intensity activity. So the the most practical answer is if she's doing that, then she probably isn't sedentary. But we don't actually know. Okay? She has no signs or symptoms. Both of her parents are living and in good health. That doesn't fully give us everything. Okay? So those of you that said she was low, how many risk factors did you guys think she has? Right? My first group. Y'all said she was low. How many risk factors would y'all have her for? What was the one potential? We don't know her, we don't know her fasting blood glucose levels, okay? Same one, okay, y'all in the back. That was the only one, okay? My moderate group, how did y'all arrive at how did y'all arrive at there being two or more? Uh, the first one you said was cigarette smoking. Okay. Ten to twenty cigarettes, that's one cigarette per full pack. I believe that is still okay. still should be uh, noted. Okay. Um, and then currently taking oral contraceptives, she's just starting out with that. Should be known because it could uh, mess her body up during the workout. Um, and the fasting blood glucose and put that down because that would be another one for your answers. So my um, for my Zoom folks, Taylor Janal, what did you guys come up with her for? Did y'all have her as as low or moderate or high? Point up the chat now. Well, y'all did all of them. Okay, y'all had her as low. Okay. So let's talk about how we should answer this. Okay. I would I would look at this and say you could say she's either low or she's moderate, depending upon we don't really have enough information. Okay. So in the most kind of technically accurate way of doing things, 
we the safest thing to do is if we don't have information on something or we don't have full information to make a decision then we count that as a risk factor okay so i would also take issue with them calling her a social smoker and smoking like 20 cigarettes a week right i have never really been a smoker and so i don't are there 20 cigarettes is that a whole pack is that really the case so that's like a pack a week that she's smoking. I would call that a smoke. That to me is not like every once in a while I have a cigarette or half a cigarette or something. I would count that as being a smoke. Okay. You can interpret it kind of however you would like there in the midst of that. The alcohol stuff doesn't matter. Okay. Her BMI is fine. Her blood pressure is fine. Her cholesterol levels are fine. Okay. We could say we don't have enough information on her exercise habits to know for sure. She's probably not sedentary, but we don't know for sure, for sure. We would need to get more information. You could count that as a risk factor, okay? So as y'all's group pointed out, if you're just starting with oral contraceptives and those kinds of things, what we've got to be careful of, though, is the risk factors are what the risk factors are. We don't need to or we get in trouble when we start trying to interpret and consider things that are outside of the scope of those seven risk factors okay so taking oral contraceptives okay that's not in any way associated with it being a risk factor so we need to just ignore all of that okay now the fasting blood glucose thing is tricky and i want you guys to write this down okay when we don't know fasting blood glucose which is the most likely thing that we won't know here's how we treat this okay if the person is not sedentary and they are not obese by bmi then we do not count that against them okay if you're not sedentary and you're not obese, there's a very, 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 very minimal chance that you'll ever have impaired fasting blood glucose. Okay? If we don't know it, okay, and the person is obese by BMI and they're sedentary, we're going to count it as a risk factor. Yes has to be both the next logical question is dr black what if she's got one of those but not the other okay generally if you've got one but not the other we don't count it against you because if you can be obese and if as long as you're not sedentary you're probably okay okay and so that's that's kind of where we are and if you're not obese but you are sedentary you're also probably okay well, that's probably the more worrisome of the ones. It's the sedentary that's the big one. Okay. So it's complicated. It's a little bit tricky. This is why it is so important that when we get a medical history, when we get this information from people, that we get as much as we can. If we ask them about their exercise and physical activity habits, we need days, amount of time, we need some estimate of intensity. So we can get that right. Okay? So we can get that right. So I would take low or moderate. When I give you one on the test, it will not be weird and ambiguous and in the middle like this. Okay? This is one that came out of, this is from the American College of Sports Medicine from one of their study books or one of their certification exams. It's just like them to put a really freaking vague one in there. That's going to be Okay. All right, we've got a few minutes. We'll do one more. Okay, we'll do one more of these. All right. So all right, you guys want the right answer? You're all wrong. Do you know why you're wrong? Read the first four words. Yep. Automatically moderate risk. 
they automatically have to go to the doctor because they're a male over the age of 45. He is very healthy otherwise. He's perfectly like there's like good on all the rest of it. But over the age of 45, that's it. We're done. You can stop right there. Okay. Those sneaky case studies that the American College of Sports Medicine gives us. So there we have it. Do you guys see kind of how all that works at least? Do you guys have some, some thoughts on that? Okay. So as we're leaving, make sure that you've written everybody that was in your group's name on a piece of paper, leave it on that desk for me. For Monday, don't close up shop just yet. For Monday, okay, on Canvas are these forms, okay? I want you for Monday to have five friends, okay? Fill these out and give them to me, okay? You can email them the electronic version, okay? And they can they can deal with them. You do not have to. I'm not encouraging you to go and be up close and personal with your friends and like hand them to them or something else, but I would like for you to get five friends to fill them out and then on the top of each one, then you guys are going to say, like, where's that person? Were they high risk? Were they low risk? Were they moderate risk? Okay? Thank you. So just the front on the far queue. And then on this one. Do not, so that it can be easy for all of us, do not have them sign anything. Do not have them put their name on here. Nothing that can be identifiable, just answer the questions, okay? All of the information on these is considered to be protected health information. This is HIPAA protected information because if you lie to us on this and we have you exercise and you've been untruthful and you have risk factors that we don't know about, then that can that could be a real problem for us. So when we fill these things out, we tell people that all of this information will be kept in confidence. Okay. It's all kept in confidence. So protect the Okay. Very good. That is 